Well, hey everybody, you're here. That's strange. Well, welcome to another episode of Fat, Dumb, and Angry. We're uh, gonna watch some shit and review it. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be a journey. So we just watched The Seat of Power. The link will be in the description. It was a movie that uh, I was part of making back in the day. You know what that all means. We were all there back in the day. Uh, the movie is about... It's a sci-fi story. It's like your regular kind of like monster attack of the killer tomatoes, we thought, but with chairs. We thought that'd be silly, right? Re your regular story of you know humans trying to survive and you try to hide what the actual... You know bat, the, what what they're fighting against for a long time. We make a, you know a lot of those chair jokes, the stool samples. <laughs> yeah, that was that was pretty good. I like that one. <laughs> and of course, you got your twists and turns along the way. Uh, a lot of twists, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of great acting. Not gonna lie, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Is that kind of perfect? Like you know they're having fun, kind of acting. <laughs> Yeah, that was, uh, I remember having a lot of fun making that and how much we filmed in our basement. <laughs> <laughs> the chair part got me quite a bit. Like, just like you kept rolling them out. Was that the same shot or did you do a bunch of takes with that? Uh, we did a couple takes, but I think, uh, too, sometimes we would push them too hard and the chairs would go like flying up a little <laughs> bit. So we had a, I think we maybe reused those ones, the ones in reverse, the reverse shot ones mm. of that. That's how I got the chairs, uh coming towards you we would push them away right and just reverse it gotcha all those little kind of tricks we used back then and i haven't ever used since and it's been a real shame for that <laughs> right one of my favorite parts about that movie is my overacting i rather enjoyed my scenes of uh the fucking coke <laughs> <laughs> i really hit nicholas cage in there i'm wearing my nicholas cage shirt today and i think that was me going pretty nicholas cage there yeah, I, I think so as well. I had those explosions. <laughs> yeah, just like the very loud outbursts he does. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. No, we have to close down. <laughs> we got to close. What about my family? Well, you know, I was uh, insane from a young age. I've decided to use that. It's a good, good basis for acting. <laughs> yeah, the... Uh... <laughs> well, I thought that was going to be... I, try, I was going to try to do a voice. That didn't kind of really work out. That's why, you know, doing voices is kind of stupid. I mean, I, I can understand doing one for a role, but if well, you're not a real, real actor, it's like, oh, boy, it was so hard to kind of try to keep something going. Well, as they say, what was your character's motivation? <laughs> uh, motivation, yeah. <laughs> Survive the chair apocalypse. <laughs> Me and Galen, we both played these characters uh, that were twins, so mm. we were playing two characters. Um, and I figured if one was an overactor, the other one would be as well. So, <laughs> I mean, they would be trying to outdo each other. Makes sense. Me and that camo outfit. Oof. I sold furniture. We did pretty good business, too. You'll have to come out here? No! We had to close down! And then uh, the scientist character was kind of funny, too. Oh. Dr. Cyan. <laughs> that line, uh, I love it. I mean, it's such a sci-fi original line. Um, no time for science, Cyan. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that's, it's and the push that, was just perfect. Yeah. It's got that classic, uh, we were watching a lot of actually sci-fi originals back then, so it probably has to do with it. I like that sci-fi feel, you know, and I think, um. But campy sci-fi. It's got what the, the low budget helps with, right? I think. Yeah. With the campiness. Yeah, with the editing and the acting, it just it makes a perfect thing. Like you guys did a great job with that. You like mixing it all pretty well. It's funny being able to look look and see like yeah, the the times where we were, you know, uh, the the commander, the sergeant character was in a completely different location. We were filming <laughs> like you could obviously tell some of those were in our backyard. Yeah. And the other one is just because the sound was completely different. <laughs> well, the, that was the only other thing that I noticed that I was like, oh, that's kind of sucks is like the first half didn't have any soundtrack it was like the second half oh and for a while i was gonna be like nick is is there no soundtrack to this short film i mean that's fine but i just was expecting like some music you guys are all musical yeah and, and then came in the back half i'm like oh okay this is perfect and then a lot right like yeah. all of yeah. it right at the back half yeah. <laughs> well i guess it's for the uh the exciting parts when we finally get to the combat yeah that was a lot of fun filming that combat that and the 
We had that one character that everybody played too. And a lot of interesting little things like that. I have to give a shout out to why is the cat so fat? Sir, is it safe? We don't even know what's in there. It was a uh, really pretty silly, pretty silly doofusy movie. But <laughs> you know the the fight scene. I love that ending fight scene with that against the mattress. And those are you know it's got some classic twists. I think that the uh, the scientist, of course, trying to betray the the sergeant because he fell in love with the monster kind of thing. You know, they always, I don't know why they do it, but yeah. it's a trope. They have to do it. Of course. And then, of course, the, you know, because you, know, you get the executive chair that's supposed to make you think that's the boss. <laughs> like, and, it's just that shiny leather look. It seems very And you get the, the mattress, of course, of the main villain. <laughs> <laughs> we all went to town on that mattress, too, to make it look the way it did. Well, at first I was like, oh, is that one of those, like, Halloween knives where the just stabs in so they didn't ruin the mattress? But no, like... The next shot, you just see it just completely opened up. Yeah, we found that mattress on the side of the road. Somebody did. I don't know how it got to my house, but we just, yeah, we took knives. We took, um, I think we took, like, a pickaxe. We took just whatever. We found axes and just started just digging into it. It was a lot harder to rip the thing apart. You know, it's a lot of metal and crap. Yeah. And that was the most damage we could do to it. Yeah, spring mattresses especially are, like, so, you know. Probably. Stabby, I guess. I don't know how to put it. I'm surprised it never, you know, flew back and hit us with something. That's why it's the yeah. main villain. <laughs> Even in death, it still attacks. <laughs> that was, and Caleb wrote that all. Yeah, that was his script. Wow. Directed it like. You know, he, he had a good vision there. He figured that thing out. Well, I was going to say that... Good little movie. Yeah. For something like... What is it? It's almost 10 minutes. Yeah. And I've watched other things that were shorter, and I felt less engaged, and it felt like it was longer. Like, that kept me engaged the whole time. Like, pretty much any of my content. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's a sign of good writing, good acting, like... Even if it's like stupid, fun, campy acting, it's still like good editing. I mean, yeah, that's, that's that, pretty impressive. I'd that, say cause. that was big too. Like some of the shots, like the one where you're looking, almost looking up the scientist's nose, kind of thing. Like, like yeah. that, that was pretty good. Wow, I even think about that. Yeah, the shot composition. That's something I don't even think about. Oof. There's a there's some good stuff there. It's like my drum set was in the picture. <laughs> yeah, that was nice. I like that. That made me feel good. Yeah, it's a little part of me. That was, that was awesome. And, and even, like, some of the set changes, you didn't... If I didn't know where they were, you, you wouldn't be able to tell, you know? Well, it's all about the close-ups. <laughs> it definitely, definitely helps. <laughs> yep. So to try to do that when you watch stuff and they do close-ups, look at look at everything around their heads. Sometimes you'll see the uh, way off. Just one color or something. This isn't over! what no. I do when I'm watching porn. Who wants to see a face? No. Yeah, right? Go back to ball sack. That's what I pay you for. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that, was, that was fucking 2008, dude. Yep. That's Everything wild. went downhill from there. That's probably the best thing we've, all done, we've ever done. <laughs> That's crazy to think about, man. Well, you know, you're young. You have enthusiasm and, and hope and dreams. And then it all gets crushed later, right? Yeah, mm. yeah, and then your feet start to hurt. <laughs> and you start thinking, wow, well, is it worth it? Well, it's like that Louis C.K. Th bit where he's like, he goes into the doctor, he's like, my knee's really hurting. He's like, oh, well, uh, and he's like, oh, and I thought, you know, like with all these young guys, they'll, they'll like reconstruct a knee or do whatever and make you pain free. It's like old guys are like, oh, we'll give you, t you gotta just take a bunch of Tylenol. All right, and well, if you do that, you'll get like bad acid reflux but you're just gonna have to live with that if you don't want shit in here so like, oh god and it's like yeah to make the choice like what do i want between the two <laughs> which is worse but that's what life is right yeah when you get older it's, well, it's supposed to be about compromise yeah but then what are you compromising for a longer shittier death <laughs> wonderful i mean there's worse things yeah there's always something mostly worse Worse than life. I know. Right? Complaining about life. Oh, that's people these days. Everyone's got to complain about something. Like, it's life. Get over it. You're lucky to be alive. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you got the opportunity. You can masturbate. The dead can't. Think about that. 
All right. <laughs> That's positivity for you, people. I'm gonna have to cut I mean, this. I guess they can, but they need help. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is it dead? <laughs> it lingers just long enough on that shit. <laughs> I don't know. You're the doctor. Yeah, there was this movie I watched recently. We're not going to review this because I'm not going to make him watch that. I'm not going to make anyone watch that. I don't even now, know if I should now, say now it. Now you almost make me want to hear what that is so I can watch it. It was like this, I don't know, maybe it was an art movie or something, but it was like a 20-minute, 30-minute movie called Aftermath. I think it came out of Spain. Didn't really even have any dialogue in it, but it was about a mortician or something like that or a uh, autopsy. And they showed you really graphic, like an autopsy of something, of like Ugh. people, and then... You know, the other person leaves, and so he just has sex with the body. <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's kind of all you just see, and then that's it. It's the whole movie. It's like 20 minutes long. It's like, and then he like goes home, and he's like feeding his dog. Spoiler alert. Yeah, he's uh, he like took like the heart or something home, and he's like him and his dog are eating it, in, like a pate or something. So I don't know, that's how I'm supposed to be like, oh, but look, he's he, he can pretend to be normal like everybody else. So they're going for like a Dexter type of thing or whatever, I guess. I so, think, but Dexter, like, knife a woman in the vagina to have, have sex with her? No, he mostly just stabbed people, I believe, so. A close to stabbing. It is stabbing, yeah. But I, I was more going for, or, I, or another good example, one of my favorites, American Psycho. More like that, I guess. Except for very graphic. Yeah. Even that movie is kind of graphic now that I think about it. Yeah, like, hardcore, like porn type scene yeah, with uh, uh, Patrick uh. Bateman yeah I haven't seen that one in a while I do remember there being a lot of blood though yeah in certain scenes right was that he had a, I think he had a chainsaw at one point he's running naked down the hallways of his like penthouse suite like down the staircase chasing this prostitute and like trying to go after her with a fucking chainsaw you're like whoa it's the way I've always wanted to see my Batman <laughs> yeah Right? He's not the hero we needed, but he's the hero we deserve. <laughs> he's bringing justice to the thoughts. <laughs> oh my god! Taking out the trash. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, fun, good movie. Mm. Speaking of good movies, yeah, we uh, we're gonna watch another thing too here, and then uh, after that, and we'll just chit chat for a little bit. We uh, we just watched Rabbits by David Lynch. It was interesting. Oh boy. Yeah, it's uh, cerebral. It's, it's cerebral, but it's also like a pain to watch because it's it feels a lot longer than it is. I think it's what 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's 15 minutes. It feels like it's almost an hour because of how monotonous it is. And the uh, the lingers it lingers a lot. Yeah. It's the lingery thing, but that's David Lynch for you. He lingers. <laughs> But like, okay, so for an example, I would say of the lingering, I think that maybe something he was going for or not was, um, you know, it lingered in that, you know, in that in that place for so long before really much happened in like, and you could hear the ambient sound and the the noises, that when the you, you got the first applause or whatever, it was so uncomfortable. It's like, oh my god, I just want that to shut up, <laughs> like. Like the noises before, like when you first started with those noises, it was really uncomfortable because you're like, why? What is it? It's like strange. It's kind of scary. But then once you got the applause, it's like, oh, I'd rather go back to that. And, like, <laughs> yeah. and I don't know if he was going for like, you know, I hear he likes to, to he, you know, have symbolism about TV and stuff or, you know, modern, yeah. whatever. So I don't know. It definitely does seem like he, he's saying something about, you know, either sitcoms or like pop culture or something with the. Uh, 
the applause and the audience reactions. Yeah, no, I mean, because I, I looked at a bunch of things in that. Because it lingers so long, you, your mind starts to wander, which is kind of one of the beautiful things he does. Is Because, you know, usually, especially people these days with how things are, they get very bored very fast. But if you watch that, your mind starts to wander and you start not paying attention to what's going on. And you're instead paying attention to, like, trying to figure out what it is. Because, like, you know, you watch a lot of movies these days, you're not thinking about what's going on. It's, like, kind of like how a lot of these reviewers on YouTube will say, like, you know, turn off your brain. Don't think about it. It's just whatever. You're just watching Bang Bang shoot em up with the superheroes. But, like, uh, that, makes you, that makes you think what you're watching for a second. It, it, like, disengages you from the content while still being part of it. And, um... <laughs> The thing for me is the lighting. Okay. Like, the lighting and the, the set. Like, I, I was looking up while we were watching just because, again, it's a very monotonous thing. But, like, I swear to God, Hideo Kojima was definitely inspired. Or, I, all right, I'm maybe not definitely, but he, I feel like he had a good inspiration from this if he saw it. Because uh, for P.T., when okay. he was doing that, you've heard of P.T., right? The playable trailer for what was going to be Silent Hills, and then they never did it. Yeah. Like... It's the same thing, the monotonous tone, and then there's this random moment, which is awesome in that with the red lights. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that came out of nowhere. Everything else to me seems like Lynch... Again, I don't know if this is how he feels, because he's a very much like a religious, like, you know, zen type of person. But um, it almost feels like an attack on, like, um, sitcoms. That's how I looked at it. Because, like, think about it, like... Every sitcom you watch, they always use the same shots over and over. And it's like the couch scene, the you know, the school scene, the whatever scene. And it's like always mostly the same shots from the same sets. Yeah. And so he's just throwing random lines of dialogue out there with random laughs. And it's like almost like you're watching an interspliced like sitcom. You're just getting random shots from the same show that's using the same shots every time. And it's boring. Yeah. And he likes being interesting with stuff. Or it's the monotony or something. I, I, what I was getting um, with the the whole sitcom-y feel was like... I went a couple different places for me. Hmm. So this uh, part of me was wondering, you know, what, like, the really the story... Like, what, what, what it really was supposed to be about. If it's supposed to just be, like, a, a sitcom ripoff or something like that. Part of me was wondering if it was supposed to be about... I don't know why I was thinking this, but like about like conflict or something and come keep coming back to that room was um, kind of uh, what was I getting out of it? Because the dialogue that the, the two other bunnies, rabbits, sorry, not bunnies, <laughs> were giving you know, like the dialogue was definitely like all over the place, but it definitely seemed to be about something, right? It just disjointed. Like asking about like a phone call. Were there any calls? What time is it? <laughs> <laughs> like he's looking for something. She's like either not telling him, or then she get, gets the she has the information though, gets Ooh. it later. Like, um, yeah, there's something that like it's like miscommunication between yeah. people in a family. And it's like the lady, or like whatever the one with the robe, which I figured was like the lady one or the wife one or whatever, right? I I couldn't tell the family relation either. Is it like or if, he's husband, wife, daughter? Or if, I thought it might have been husband, wife, and like who he's cheating on with her or something like that, or like another. Mm. Because she seemed jealous of something, or maybe that was a daughter or something, the one on the couch, and it's like, so I, I was thinking that if it had something to do with, because it was like conflict, because it keep, keep, kept seeming like, uh, like he was trying to, I don't know if it was like trying to resolve something or, or something like that, because some of the dialogue would be said, and then he'd get up to leave. And it always seemed like he'd slink out of there or like he was scared, right? There was like a knock at the door and something would call him out of there. But then yeah. he, the weird part to me of that seemed like he was brought out of there. But then every time he came back, he came back. It seemed like confidently, you know, 
Yeah. Like he either hmm, either changed or something like that, or he reset, which maybe maybe that's the sitcom thing. Maybe or maybe that's you know part of that. Well, the but. the other part of it that I loved because this is the stuff I really look at with Lynch a lot of times is the stories are always wild and don't make sense, but sometimes the shots are what help you make some sense of it, whether it be your interpretation or what he intended. But like, what I liked about it, like I said before, the lighting is very dingy, but most importantly, the angle of the camera and the set itself, um, cause it's what it felt like to me because it was so sparse. There wasn't a lot of love in that set. You looked at it, there was an ironing board, there was a couch, there was like sort of a back area that led to somewhere, but you don't know where you don't even know. You can't even tell where they live. Are they in a city? Are they in a household? You can't really tell. All there is a, is that back area and the door and there's not there. So it's like it, what it felt like was like almost like a play, like yeah. you're watching a play, um, live. So then we're like, yeah, that, that red scene where the red light comes on and everything like that. Um, is that supposed to be the call that he's waiting for? They keep talking about like a call, right? And then after, because after that scene, it seems like then she tells the truth or says that he did get a call or something. So I wonder if that was the call. See, it might be because I'm, you know, a little bit inebriated, let's just say. Um, but I wasn't paying too much attention to what they were saying. Like, it eventually, that's why I went to the conclusion of, you know, that it's saying the monotony of sitcoms and the shots that they have and everything. And I went that route is because eventually I just lost track of what they were saying and I stopped paying attention and just kind of watched to see what would happen. So... I, you know, that that's why it's cool to hear what you have to say about that, because you were paying attention to what they were saying. Hey, you said David Lynch. I knew I was going to have to over-examine this thing. <laughs> yeah. and, and what's great about that is you were examining it from that standpoint of, like, not only taking in, like, all the shots and what's in there and everything, but also what they were saying, whereas I was purely looking at it for themes and... Um, you know, set design, camera shot, because it's a little, it's aimed a little up. Like you're almost from a god voyeuristic position too. That's the other thing. It's not straight on like a lot of shots are. Mm. So and that, they're rabbits, right? Yeah. So they're not people. They're rabbits, right? Are they something below us? Yeah. So it's almost like you're looking into their hutch or whatever, you know. But what do you, okay? Then what do you think? So you you have no idea what you think that red scene was supposed to be about, or like what? I yeah, that's the one part of that short that I just I. I'm completely unsure what it could potentially mean. Like it, you know, it has what I believe to be the other rabbit come in with two candles above her head. And there's like a little face in the corner. Yeah. And yeah. And that's saying some stuff. And like, I, I just, I can't picture what he was trying to say with that. I, I can't. Why red? What does red make you think of? What does that color represent? You know, anger. I mean, that's that's it's not my favorite color. For me, my favorite color is blue. But um, for people that like red, there's a lot of stuff behind it. It's so kind of like purple's royalty. Red's usually danger. You know, uh, a lot of animals have red on their skin to signify that they're poisonous or you know some sort of harmful. Um, it can represent love, hearts, and blood. Blood in the sense of like you know, blood brothers or whatever, but also in the sense of, you know, spilling blood and war. Um, it has, like, dual meanings of, but they're both very high-intensity, like, descriptions. It's either extreme violence or extreme passion, like sex and just mm. pure love of someone. Extreme in general. Yeah, it's... Because the other thing, too, that makes me think that kind of stands out, the only other character, other than whatever the hell that thing was supposed to be, was the man in the green suit or whatever outside the door but you never saw but and you know what is was there a man in a green suit in Twin Peaks or am I misremembering something green suit there's the man from another place who's in a red suit uh, but yeah. not a uh, no green suit no oh, green well, suit so what do you think that would mean then because the the apartments but that was more like blue right like it was drabby like yeah it was cool because it was earthy colors yeah. he picked like a very light sky blue oh, for this boy. the scenes and then like the the uh, carpet was dirt brown earthy colors okay yeah 
Well, and I could see kind of going in the direction of like, you know, nature. Is this about nature, you think, then? Or like, yeah. Mixing well, nature and television together? Or like nature and. Well, again, sitcoms, it's something in their own, their natural habitat, so to speak, being a voyeur. Again, going from that camera angle of coming from above. Yeah. It's kind of a voyeuristic position and using. So it's like saying we're watching people like animals. I mean. Again, he's a very much a peace, love, and rock and roll type of dude, so I wouldn't expect him to have as harsh of thoughts. But at the same time, maybe he also fucking loves Rammstein, so who the hell knows? Maybe it's supposed to be like a, uh, a perspective of like what a higher dimensional being would think of a sitcom or whatever. So there's rabbits in the rolls, and it's like it seems like there's Ooh. nothingness and pointlessness, but then, then the red part is what every not only sitcom but every what every story's based off which is like the conflict and that the conflict is you know like what what looks scary and dangerous cause that's because then not everything is also just stupid hmm. you know with like laughs or whatever and maybe there's something there but then again what is the man in the green suit supposed to be <laughs> yeah i mean well that's, that's why like, does he keep yeah, he keeps bringing the, the mail out for is that money oh boy a man in a suit is green could be money it could be, yeah. And making the guy leave, and they did have a. She did have a line, something about like he goes to work every day or something. Like, it could be the monotony uh, of that too, and like there's no excitement except for this one period where they have excitement, and then it goes. And actually, that's again, this is where Lynch is crazy because it's such a weird. Like, if you just looked at it objectively, you just be like. These are a bunch of people in a f- fucking weird costume sitting around. Naomi Watts is in one of them. Yeah, Naomi Watts is one of them. Um, and, like, they're just doing weird shit to be weird, and it's artsy and stupid, which is, I used to think that way. But, like, you can find certain things and stuff like that that's really cool and different thoughts. And, like, for that, it's like that's almost a representation of life that people don't like to look at. You know, everybody thinks their life's going to be like the movies. It's going to be exciting and like Harry Potter or something like that, you know? And then as you grow up, you realize it becomes monotonous, and that's just how life is with a few exciting points, like that red point, Mm -hmm. although it was a freaky way to to get the point across. But there's a few exciting points in your life like that, and then it just goes back to, you know, the regular routine. We all have routines. I wonder, too, if it was, um, if there was some meaning behind the, the applause when he comes in. Not just, you know, like, the regular meaning of, like, the sitcom thing, but I... Because it seemed like he made it so fucking annoying on purpose. Like, I wanted it just to shut the fuck up. And I was wondering if he was doing that to be, like, a representation of how annoying it is for this guy to come home or something. Or, like, Ooh. and he's getting mm-hmm. home and it's just, like, that nonstop applause that happens every time he walks in. And it's just, like, shut up. Yeah. And he kind of goes, it huh. seems like his attitude always seems to go downhill once he gets home and all that kind of stuff. Hmm. Oh, I see. Now that's something cool that you noticed. I didn't know she, because you, before you said you thought he walked in and he seemed confident, and then now you're saying he kind of like gets a bit down when he comes in. Well, yeah, he comes in confident, but then it's all about going down until he slinks back to the door and leaves for the yeah. green man, the man in the green suit, so he can come back home. But you would think the opposite, right? You think it'd be like a story. You're saying he's a Lynch... wage slave, aren't you? <laughs> well, yeah, but David Lynch seems a little bit more positive to say that he'd come home to a shitty life and then leaving makes him feel better than being home. But maybe not. I mean, maybe this is supposed to be a story about... Hmm. I think... Maybe... Okay, maybe the villain or maybe like the antagonist or whatever, the bad thing is supposed to be the, the other woman bunny or something like that. The whole thing with the, the two candles or whatever came out with. Maybe they're supposed to be like knives or something. And maybe there's supposed to be some evil thought there of like hmm. these two people. But Or tension maybe. Yeah, because you, cause you did. Uh, if you noticed at the end too, what it ended on was the two of them consoling her or whatever. You know, coming yeah. to her. It wasn't about making anybody else feel better. It was about that. I mean... Everybody thinks their life's a movie and very kind of, um, you know, exciting all the time, but really life's mundane and kind of simple except for those few exciting moments in your life that are, 
you can again like i was saying they can either be two things because red represents two things that are very intense moments which are usually moments of happiness or moments of sadness anger well, thank you um well that's what david lunch david lunch <laughs> that's my favorite during the noon i love david lunch um that's what david lynch i think loves to do is he he like terrifies you with the monotony of like life and stuff like during the normal scenes and stuff and so, like, the regular world, at least to me, the regular, like, world he builds is already kind of freaky, but then brings in these scarier situations, you know, and, like, these more terrifying kind of things happen that come really compound onto that. Um, so not only, like, unsettling, but then all of you get, like, a little bit of fear as well in some of those parts. I think... Well, let me ask you this. What made you the most uncomfortable? Huh. Visually. Not so much dialogue or whatever, but, like, I'm... Because that's always what I'm curious about is, like, I love set design type stuff. What, what about that set made you uncomfortable? Because I could name a few things. But. The set itself. Um, yeah, and when I say set, set, lighting, camera position, whatever. Like what? Yeah, what made angles, you go? Uh, <laughs> the angles of that, right? The uh, the unknown. Like you didn't can tell what the hell's back there because it didn't seem like anything was back there, you know. But there was a back there. Um, lighting. I was gonna say like kind of the angles. You know, like you said earlier that because you, you're filming from higher up, it almost seemed like. They were bending up, and it seemed a little unnatural, right? The whole thing. Yeah, yeah It seemed yeah. like a kind of like a cage or something. That and the colors. You mentioned the colors earlier. I didn't even notice the colors, and how that probably applies to the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> With him, yeah, it could be anything. That's that's what's crazy. It's like you can really overanalyze it. And what's cool about that is, I th I don't know if he was the person to say that, but it's like he was almost like every answer's right. Yeah, that's that's why he, his stuff is great because you know, and why pe people. I think are challenged by it. But that's what makes it fun. It's like you have to do the, some of the work. You can't just turn your brain off and do it because you're going to be like, eh, what the heck is happening? What does this mean? You know, it's movie. How long is this movie even? <laughs> My girlfriend would say. It's because, you know, like the dream state he creates and all that stuff, it helps you get into it because it becomes more of a personal kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And it's two types of entertainment as well, if you think about it. Like... And it's cool how he does it. So it's, you know, entertainment is watching a film, but it's also a game mm. in a certain extent because he's kind of goading you into trying to figure out what's going on. So he's trying to, like you said, challenge you. That's what made me think of that. It's interactive in a certain sense, unlike most movies where somebody's telling you a story. This is, you're watching a story, but you're telling your own story kind of thing. Yeah. And, um... It's just really cool. And the other part of that, like I said, he's a very peaceful, like, I'm trying to remember. Was it Buddhist? I think he's a Buddhist. Um, it's a very Zen type of dude. I believe in Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> I believe in the Buddha. Um, he's a big man. <laughs> not too tall. <laughs> just right. But, uh, and it also gets people talking. And, you know, talking creates... A sort of unity and that's kind of what he's about so sharing ideas creates dreams yeah. new ideas you know create new dreams um just don't let your dreams be memes. yeah don't let your dreams be <laughs> memes psa out there so i couldn't resist do not forget that today is friday <laughs> Where was it? I hear someone. So we're going to get into it. Um, I didn't want to have to talk about this, but I think it's going to have to come out. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to finally start unleashing the secrets of QAnon. <laughs> I think everybody is going to have to finally know the secrets behind Q. And the secret is, it's that's actually Q from Star Trek The Next Generation. It's that character from Q. <laughs> and he's just messing with people. But you know why? <laughs> and this is so stupid because it's about Star Trek The Next Generation. But he's, he's doing it. He's messing with all these conservatives because it pisses off Patrick Stewart, <laughs> who is John Luke Picard, and he's just fucking with him still. He doesn't even know it. that's the power of Q. He came to this dimension of reality. He was only in TV at first, but now he's here. He's Q. He's got his anons, and he's fucking with Patrick Stewart to this level. Dreams really do come true. Be careful what you wish for. P.S. 
<laughs> What's like Kevin Sorbo? What was he? He wasn't Conan. He was Hercules, right? Yeah. It's like because he's, I believe, a conservative and he's pretty outspoken, like James Woods. And uh, I, the last post I saw from him that kind of cracked me up was, it's like we can't play, baby. It's cold outside due to misogyny and rapey overtones. Anyway, here's a WAP. <laughs> Fucking crack me up. A WAP. Yeah. We got hoes in this country. <laughs> we got hoes in this country. We got hoes. That'd be a great way to start a song. Would that be offensive? No. I don't know what's offensive. It's all offensive now. I mean, it's also tiresome, as the meme says. Yeah. What are you really supposed to... That's the thing. Is like, I know what I find offensive. <laughs> what am I lied to find offensive? That's. I guess those are the different things, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently what I find offensive doesn't matter, though. Mm. That's not what's deemed worthy to, you know, censor and worry about. It's only what other people find offensive. Yeah. Like my rights. My rights to my penis. <laughs> they want to lock me up. My penis, that is. Yeah. Lock that dick up. This is why communism will never work, everybody. <laughs> I can prove it through masturbation. All right. Please go on. All right. If you are disabled and you have no arms and no hands, do people just show up to jack you off? Do people just oh, do the right God. thing and come to take care of somebody in need, or do you have to find a way to fuck your mattress and get off? I'm thinking the latter. All right. As opposed to capitalism and the capitalist system. He can go arms. on. He, no, in the capitalist system, he can go online and buy a sex toy and fuck something natural. Natural-ish. <laughs> of course, your hand is the most natural. <laughs> it's more natural than a woman, for sure. That's, but I just proved... fucked up and funny. I just proved how capitalism is better than communism so in five seconds. Mean, it's that easy. Yeah. <laughs> Take that, <laughs> libtard. Yeah. I mean, unless there's a communist out there willing to come give me a hand job, I might have to change <laughs> my mind. <laughs> I might I have to change my mind. I mean... Is that a con communism any man can get behind? Maybe that's all it is. Because their side is more likely to have all the hoes. So maybe they're just hoeing out. You know, like Charles Manson and stuff. All of these cult leaders, they know you have to get the women because then you can get the men. If they have more women on their side. Mm. Yeah. The men in the club, right? Man's getting the most ladies in the club. <laughs> Man's getting, that's Biden. Biden's getting <laughs> the most ladies right now. Can you imagine that? He, you know, do you, can you imagine the amount of sniffing going on in the White House right now? <laughs> there's it's like a gotta Hoover be, vacuum. There's, there's got to be Secret Service women agents running, fearing for their lives. Just, yeah, like a vacuum going up and down the chambers. <laughs> Somebody get the nasal spray away from him. He's unstoppable. <laughs> I could still smell Baron here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sniff him out. Mm, there's that blood hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's gonna be. I'm not saying he's a pedophile. I'm saying he's most likely a pedophile. Of course, it hasn't been proven. <laughs> I'm not that saying, but hey, well, why not? They, they, if they can do it, we can. 